and then we can try to generate good intentions of being here. May us here coming together to listen, to discuss, to reflect, contemplate. May all of these become cause and conditions to generate and fully develop through love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. within our mind stream and mind stream of all sentient beings. And having cultivated the four immeasurables, may we be able to Generate through both to the mind and wisdom, realizing emptiness as soon as possible. In having generated those spiritual experiences, realization. May we always be help and benefit to not just one set, all sentient beings. Directly, indirectly, either through body, speech, mind, all of them. And may it be cause and condition to achieve fully awakened state. So not only we can be help and benefit, but to be great as help and benefit. And not only for few, but to each and every sense and beings. Okay, so then we do the, the prayer. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merit of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit thus my greater beings. Sangye Chodan Sogye Chonam La Changju Badu Dane Kapus Dagi jin so give it for nam ge, do la penge sang ge do ba. Sang ge so dang so ge so nam la, sang ju ba do dane ya to. Dagi jin so give it for nam ge, do la penge sang ge do ba. May all sentient beings have happiness and causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that knows no suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment and hatred for those held close and distant. Uh, 
Last week we just um, started on this particular uh, topic of the four immiscible, and uh, within the four immiscible we discuss about the the first one, um, immiscible love. Um, and today um, we discuss about the. Uh, the second, the compassion, immiscible compassions. Again, um, compassion, uh, true compassion uh, is a mental factors, a state of mind um, that wish others to be others to be free from suffering and cause of sufferings. Um, and not only the wish, uh, wish to be free from suffering and cause of suffering, it is a state of mind, you know, um, compassion, true compassion, a state of mind that is selfless, uh, detached, um, you know, that want to see uh, someone being free from the suffering and the cause of suffering and the urge to help to reduce and relieve the sufferings. Um, so true compassion is very different from the mind of pity, you know, where um, in the pity, you don't have the urge to help you know, you don't have the urge to help, you know, um, to free from or to release or to free from the suffering and cause of suffering. Whereas true compassion has the urge uh, to free, to help to free or to reduce the suffering and cause of suffering. Um, true compassion has sense of taking the you know responsibility or urge to do to help to to reduce or to free or release from the suffering the opposite mind of compassion is you know cruel mind you know wishing other to see them sufferings you know, uh, wishing other wishings, you know, um, other to suffer. Uh, cruelly mind, you know. Um, and also, true compassion is not a sentimental or emotion, you know, is not sentimental. And again, we have to, we have to, you uh, know, uh, understand the differences, you know. Um, Mm. True 
compassion is rooted on a firm commitment and um, that is based on kind of reasoning and wisdom, um, wisdom you know. Um, so just, um, I just wanted to reach uh, 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 sections on that from his own Dalai Lama, you know, in his compassionate, in the book on compassionate life, where he says, true compassion, not just an emotional response, you know, sometimes you see pain and suffering, you know, then you have this kind of sense of emotional response in that moment, you know. Um, in that moment, you know. Um, so that is why true compassion, not just an emotional response, but a firm commitment founded on reasons. And because of this firm foundations, a truly compassionate attitude towards others does not change even, they, even if they behave negatively. That is very important because most of our compassion is, is very sentimental, very uh, emotional response. We have that as long as the person behave well. As the moment we see the person behave negatively, then our feeling changes. And so, because that is not rooted on that firm commitment that, and so that's true compassion that here we talk about the Buddha encouraged us to cultivate. It's not just that kind of momentary sentimental, emotional response, but it is something very strong, firmly committed, based on reasonings, based on reasoning that whether the person behave positively or negatively, that person do not wish suffering. And cause of suffering, they do not wish suffering, and they have right to not to suffer, on the, base, on the basis of that understanding and reasoning, that is where the, the compassion is cultivated and developed on that, com that reasoning, that understanding, that wisdom. And so therefore, um, so here he should not continue. Genuine compassion is based not on your own protect, projections and expectations, you know. Because a lot of those sentimental emotional response, a lot of time is based on our own projections and expectations instead of being based on, uh, you know, um, uh, on real uh, resistance, but rather on the needs of others, you know, in respect of whether the other person is a close friend or enemy, as long as that person wishes for peace and happiness and wishes to overcome sufferings. So that should be the true compassion. Um, the emotional response, sentimental feeling, you know, even the animals, you can see even the animal, um, uh, feel that, even the animal express that. You can see even the, within the animal. And uh, even we have that kind of feelings. Even when before you started meditating, even you didn't know anything about compassions, you know. You know, even you don't know anything about compassions, that kind of response, sometimes we can feel it. 
you know, even without meditating, learning on that. And such, such compassion is unstable and is not the true compassion that that the stable com stable compassion. So that is where you know the stable compassion is based and founded of on reasoning, um, based on wisdom understandings, not a, just a moment of yeah, um, and that is why true compassion not easy to develop. That is why it required a lot of practice. You know, sentimental, emotional response of that kind of compassion, you know, we don't need to put so much effort, meditate, practice, you know. You go outside of your house and you see, you know, the pain and suffering, you can feel it easily. You don't have to put so much effort, you know. But true compassion, where you can hold that compassion all the time, regardless how they behave, regardless whether they are on the, whether they are, you know, in the hospital or not in the hospitals, you know, um, to be able to feel that compassion all the time, to be able to feel for everyone in that, um, uh, you know, to feel that. Um, so that 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 is not easy. That requires a lot of practice, a lot of effort. That is why becoming both sadhavas. It's not easy because to become bodhisattva, you need to have bodhicitta. To have bodhicitta, you need to have great compassion. And to have that compassion, not only for one person, for all sentient beings. For us to have that kind of true compassion, even for one person, is not easy. Take your best friend, take your children. Take your parent, your relative, you are very close. You have that feeling, compassion, but when they started to act differently, when they started to behave differently, you don't feel the same way. You started to get upset. You don't feel compassion, you started to feel upset. And that is why to have true compassion, even for one person, Require a lot of practice, a lot of real practice, effort, you know. A lot of practice and effort. And then imagine when you are able to feel that for all things and beings, you know, then that, that requires even more effort, even more practice. Um, but once we are able to develop such compassion, true compassion, you know, when once we are able to feel that true compassion, you know, then you know it makes huge difference in your life. You know, um, it makes huge difference in your life. You know. Um, And the difference, you know, between the sentimental, emotional compassion and true compassion is with the sentimental, emotional response, responsive compassion, you know, you don't have the, one does not have the, um, sense of same confidence and same um, cultures like when you have true compassion then you have incredible confidence and cultures and because of such strong courage 
and confidence. You know, you don't become overwhelmed by seeing the sufferings, you know. You don't, you don't get overwhelmed, you know. At the moment, you know, we can be overwhelmed very easily, you know, when we, when we see too much sufferings, too much suffering in the world, too much suffering in your friends, families, or sometimes seeing too much suffering, even in one being, can make you very, uh, you know, very overwhelming. It becomes so overwhelming sometimes in order to protect ourselves, then we sometimes create kind of wall, you know. Sometimes we try to create a wall because you feel the pain so much and you are too overwhelmed by that and not being able to handle it, not being able to, you know, um, that. And in order to protect yourself, sometimes we kind of create wall so that you don't feel that, so you don't become too overwhelmed. That is just, um, you know, make you kind of, you know, um, not, able, not being able to function properly because you are too overwhelmed by that. You know, why? Because, you know, at the moment, even though we have, you know, certain level of compassion, but that is more, more of sentimental and emotional compassion, you know, and because of that, that doesn't have same level of the courage and the confidence that true compassion can give or true compassion can, uh, you know, And so that is a huge difference. That is a huge difference. And true compassion is like, you know, um, the mountains, you know, the mountains feel all the storms, big, small, all the big storm, but it doesn't get moved. You know, it's still there is, it feel all the storms, you know, all the rains, all the heat, everything, but it's very stable. On the other hand, you know, the sentimental compassion is like kind of like, you know, a tree, you know, it feels the all the storm and it can knock it down. You know, it can knock it down. And that is how we feel a lot of time, being knocked down by the pain and suffering. Not just our suffering, but the suffering of others our family, friends in the world, sometimes you can knock out down because, you know, and that is the difference. So that is that here, you know, is encouraged uh, here, uh, trying to develop that true compassion. Um, and of course, you know, in our time, you know, there are so many great example beings from all spiritual um, path who live with such great compassions or with a, such a true compassion. And because they live with such a true compassion, even though they have seen so much suffering and pain, you know, they were not knocked down completely or overwhelmed completely, you know, and, um, you can see, you know, uh, so many, so many others, yeah. Um, in, instead, it gives them more courage and more confidence, you know, to do more. To do more. For us, it knocked on us, you know, then we feel I'm done, enough. I've done as much as I can, you know. There's no more energy, there's no more I can take on. That is how we feel, you know. But when you have true compassions, you know, you never feel that way, you, you never feel that way. You know, the more 
the more you feel like you, you, you can do more, the more you feel like you can give more, the more you feel like you have more energy to do and give and so forth. And that is um, Yeah, so, you know. And therefore, that being the very important factors, especially um, uh, for a Buddhist practitioner, and especially Mahayana practitioner, you know, that is, um, through compassion is the very root of all the Buddhist um, Mahayana practice. Therefore, as Lama Subhadra Bhutti always says, you know, live with compassion, work with compassion, you know, whenever you work, trying to generate the motivation of compassion, try to bring motiv compassion and motivation. When we try, when we die, try to die with motivation of compassion. When you try to meditate, whatever different form of meditation, try to meditate with the compassion motivations, you know. Whatever we enjoy in our life, you know. Try to enjoy with the compassion motivations, you know. Whenever problem arises, you know. Then again, you know, try to experience, you know, all the problem, challenges, difficulties with the compassion motivations. So basically, you know, as Buddha said in the Sutta, you know, try to practice to love compassion day and night, all the time. When you are walking, when you are sleeping, when you are standing, you know, uh, when you are sitting, you know, whatever you do, you know, um, Try to apply, um, try to generate that motivation so, to love and compassion as much as possible. So that is a little bit on compassion. And again, you know, we, if you go more details, you know, then, then, then there is, you know, as we just mentioned, kind of sentimental compassion, then true compassion. And then immutable compassion and the great compassions. You know, and again, each of those compassions, you know, you can have true compassion to one person or someone. One can have true compassion to one, but not for immutable, countless sentient beings. And then with a the practice, one can extend that, that true compassion to more and more beings and then to expand to the immiscible countless sentient beings, but not necessarily to include each and every sentient beings. And then, you know, to be able to expand to each and every sentient being without excluding any sentient beings, then, you know, great compassion. And also sometimes, the difference between the immeasurable compassion and great compassion can be sometimes understood in terms of the objects. The object of immeasurable is countless sentient beings. Countless sentient beings or immeasurable uh, sentient beings doesn't necessarily mean each and every sentient beings, you know, but in the great compassion, it has to include each and every sentient being in your objects. But other way that you find in others um, is that you know, in immeasurable compassions, you know, you wish the others to be free from suffering and cause of suffering, but you don't necessarily take full responsibility yourself to do that. Whereas in great compassions, you know, not only you wish them to be free from suffering and cause of suffering, but you actually take responsibility on yourself to free them from suffering and cause of suffering. So then it becomes a little more stronger in that. Um, 
So anyway, um, let's not go in. Um, and then next in terms of four immutable is, uh, you know, sympathetic joy, you know, the joy, immutable joy, sympathetic joy. Mm -hmm. So is again a state of mind or mental factors, you know, that is being happy with someone's prosperity, someone's fortune, someone's happiness, you know. A mind, a mind or mental factors, mental state that is being happy, just as we be, just as we would be happy when we have fortune, when we have prosperity, when I'm happy. Same way, you know, when being happy with someone's happy and joyful, happy and joyful for someone's fortune, someone's happiness, someone's prosperities, you know. Um, And the opposite of that mind is, you know, not being happy, not being happy and joyful to see someone's other's fortune, happiness, and prosperity, you know. And that is the mind of jealousy, the mind of jealousy, you know. When you have jealousy, mind, you know, then, you know, instead of being happy to uh, to see someone's fortune, prosperity, happiness, we are not so happy, you know, that that's, so not being happy, instead being jealous with others, you know. With jealousy, you know, somehow your mind is unable to accept others' fortune or others' Um, happiness or others, you know, um, prosperities, you know. Again, that comes from, you know, selfish attitude. That comes through selfish attitudes. Because, you know, we feel like that should be happening to me. I should have the happiness. I should have the prosperity. I should have the fortune due to that kind of selfish attitude. And instead of me having happiness and fortune and prosperity, someone else happy. And so therefore, you know, um, if uh, instead of feeling happy for see someone in that, but we become unhappy and jealous. Hmm? So therefore, you know, um, rejoicing and feeling happy for others' fortunes, others' prosperity, others' happiness, others, you know, virtues, you know, others' progress, you know, um, All the good things is very beneficial and helpful. When we train our mind to be happy with by seeing others that, you know, then you feel less jealous. You know, you feel less jealous and you are more happy. And therefore, you know, one by seeing them, you become happy. You know, you become happy, even though you didn't, even though you didn't have prosperity yourself. But by seeing someone prosperity and being happy with that, 
it's almost like having a prophecy also because you are happy with that. By seeing fortune on others, even if you didn't have the fortune like they have, by being happy with that, by rejoicing and by joy, feeling joy, then again, it makes you happy. And that is wonderful. You know, it's wonderful. And to see happy, other happy and making yourself happy, that is wonderful instead of feeling more miserable. And also by feeling joy in others' virtues and others' prosperity and fortunes, you know, and happiness, you know. Also, we, we know, we create, you know, uh, also karma, marriage, you know, by doing that. On the other hand, when we feel unhappy about others' fortune, you know, prosperity, happiness, and virtues, we create negative karma. And when we cultivate joy and happiness in others, we create more positive karma, more merit, you know. And of course, for the other persons, they will be extremely happy, more happy, if they see or if they feel that you are happy for their happiness. They will feel even more happy if they feel that you are happy for their fortune, their prosperity, their virtues. On other hand, if they feel you are unhappy with their fortune, their happiness, their well-being, their virtues, they will be sad. They might they feel they feel uh, kind of unhappy. So you know, it, it to yourself you create more merit, more virtues, and it also makes others more happy by them to feel, see that and for them to see and feel that you are happy for them, for that. So it, again, benefit both in um, immediately and in the long term, you know. And also, you know, we also try to, you know, practice rejoice in our own fortune, our own prosperity, our own happiness, our own virtues as well, you know. Uh, and that will help us to be less negative about our feel negative about ourselves and it could also help you know a lot of time when we feel negative about ourselves and then that is where that can lead to depressions or or other you know other dark places you know um feeling negative about ourselves feeling bad about ourselves um, you know, and that could lead to a kind of self loathing, self hatred, depressions, all those. It is it's possible that can lead in that direction. Uh, and that happens because, you know, we feel, you know, too much negativity, you know, too much negativity. And so to, to balance and to counter that, we need to contemplate, meditate, and practice, you know. The positivities as well, all, you know. And it is it is hard when your mind is in negative state. It is hard to see positive, positive, you know. Like people who are feeling going that direction, even they have the really good quality, positive quality, and someone trying to remind them, oh, you, you know, you are such a good this and that, is hard for them to feel that when you are. So therefore, because you are not used to that, but if you are every day rejoicing in your own virtues, your own goodness, all of that, and you build up that mind, you know, you build up that, and then you begin to also see the positive for yourself, you know, positive others rejoicing in that positive. And, and so then when you have that strong mind that, see the positiveness, even sometimes you feel negative, but because you have that strong mind that has built up over the days, weeks, and months through such practice, 
then you have something that can balance or that negative thought from overwhelming or uh, negative feeling from overwhelming. Um, so it can be, um, you know, um, very beneficial and um, helpful. And of course, when in terms of when we talk about the, the immeasurable joy, you know, we are referring specifically, more specifically to, you know, um, the happiness of, you know, liberation and fully enlightenment. And that is why in the prayer it says, you know, um, may they never be separated from happiness that has no sufferings or that, that is free from suffering or that is no suffering. So that is a cost, you know, we can um, wish them all the, the um, immediate kind of prosperity, fortune, happiness, virtues, you know, and not to be separated from them, you know, whatever they have, not to be separated from them, you know. If they have good health, not to be separated from that good health. You know, if they have good job, something they enjoy and something they like, that give them have, not to be separated from that, you know. Um, whatever happiness, not to be separated from that. So all of that, but especially, especially here, specifically more of not to be, to wish them to have happiness of liberation and fully enlightenment and not to be separated from some such, um, such happiness and cause of such happiness. And the fourth is the equanimity. And there are many different, when um, you find equanimity, but it means different in different contexts. You know, um, So here, um, you know, is a uh, equanimity towards other sentient beings. You know, not being, not discriminating, having so much strong attachment to some and so much, you know, sense of hatred and anger to some, you know, instead kind of um, feeling, you know, trying to feel kind of equal to all, um, trying to develop feeling of equal to all, you know. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, equanimity from the Buddhist perspective is a state of mind, you know, that is unbiased, you know, undiscriminating, you know, a more clear-minded tranquility state of mind, you know, not being overwhelmed by the delusions of strong attachment and strong um, anger and hatred, you know. Mm -hmm. So when we have that kind of equanimity, you know, you don't separate, you know, friends, enemies, strangers, and treat them differently. But instead, you know, when you have that kind of equanimity, you treat them equally to all, you know instead of dividing 
then in the totally different um, division, a different category, and then, you know, treating or responding, um, acting very differently. Instead, you know, um, trying to respond, trying to, uh, one will respond, uh, uh, react and treat more equally, more equally. At the moment, you know, that is hard for us. It's hard for us to treat everyone equally. And because, again, we haven't developed that true equanimity. If we have really developed that equanimity, then, you know, we'll treat more equal to everyone, you know. Also, a lot of time the pain and suffering we experience is because of again that non equanimity, you know, that mind, because of that bias, discriminating mind. Either we are too attached to some, strongly attached to some. Due to that, we suffer, or we have a strong anger and hatred to some, and due to that, we also suffer. If we have more state of more equanimity, you know, then we suffer less. We suffer less. You know, we don't have that true extreme mind. We are not overwhelmed by that true extreme mind, you know. And we suffer a lot because of those true extreme mind. Those true extreme mind. Mm. And one thing we have to differentiate is, you know, equanimity from, equanimity doesn't equal or same as being indifference. Do you get it? A lot of time, people misunderstand that. Being indifferent. Being indifferent and equanimity is very different. You know? Being indifferent, you don't care. You know, being indifferent, you don't care whether anyone suffer or not, whether anyone is happy or not, suffering or not, you know. Um, here is more of feeling same, feeling same, feeling equally. You know, it's not being indifferent. It's more of um, feeling same or equal and then treating same way equally. Um, And which is, again, you know, not so easy. Not so easy. It requires a lot of practice, you know. Some, it could be lifetime. Even just that equanimity might be our lifetime project, you know. It might be even many lifetime projects, you know. Um, To really to to be able to really uh, develop the true attitude or the mental state of true equanimity, you know, um, So therefore, we have to be careful when we try to practice equanimity not to fall into a kind of indifference and apathy, you know, not caring at all, you know, that that doesn't mean equanimity, you know. You know, 
you don't care anyone's, you don't care your family, friends, you don't care others, you know, is as though they do not exist, you know. So it doesn't affect you, you know, friends, enemy, whatever the others, what happens to you, it doesn't affect you because they do not exist for you, you because you totally shut down all of them. You don't care about them. You don't have any, you know, uh, feeling for them. Uh, and totally indifference, totally apathy, so totally not caring. That is not equanimity. That is not definitely not the equanimity here. That um, and such equanimity, such equanimity, you know, is the foundations. Such equanimity is the foundations to cultivate, you know, true altruistic love, compassion, and bodhicitta mind. You know, as as we discuss, true great love, compassion, great compassion is to be able to feel love and compassion for all sentient beings equally. You know, and without that kind of true compassion and love, there's no bodhicitta. In order to have bodhicitta, you need to develop true love and great compassion, true, true, true uh, love and compassion that, that is extend to all sentient beings. In order to feel that true love, compassion, all sentient beings equally, you know, you need to have the equanimity. And therefore, the equanimity, the practice of equanimity and the attitude of equanimity is the foundation for all this altruistic love, true love, compassion, bodhicitta. And therefore, in the training, you know, in the bodhicitta, Mind training, whether you follow the, the technique of equalizing and exchanging self with others, or whether you follow the technique of seven point of cause and effect, you start with the equanimity meditation and practice. You start with the equanimity, you know, um, it, is, it is mentioned, you know, in order to build a stable house, you have to even the ground. If you don't even the ground, then the house you build will, might not be stable. No. Um, maybe nowadays, maybe with all the technology, maybe there might be, uh, you know, there might be a way to do it. But of course, uh, we are giving examples where, you know, in the old time when you try to build up with, you know, Without all this technology and then some 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 of the um, poles longer small because of that and then it become unbalanced unstable uh, you know the house will be kind of unstable uh, so therefore to have more stable uh, that you need to um, even the ground similarly in order to have stable true love compassion both that then we need to have the even ground of the equanimity. Mm. And here, specifically when we talk about um, for immeasurable, then, you know, is the wish to all sentient beings to abide in that equanimity you know, without being, you know, um, overwhelmed by the true same mind of attachment to strong attachment, some and strong hatred to others, because that is the cause of their unhappiness. You know, because that is the cause of unhappiness. Whereas abiding equanimity is cause of, you know, peace, calm, happiness. Um, so not only you wish others to abide in equanimity, but you also practice to be practice 
It's not just wishing others. It's like, you know, wishing others to be a good person, but not trying yourself to be a good person. You know, trying, wishing others to be equanimity, but yourself, you know, being very biased. You know, that doesn't work. So, of course, we wish others to abide equanimity, and we try to practice that ourselves. You know, we try to practice as much as possible, you know. Sometimes, you know, such biased mind can arise easily because of our delusions. Because our delusion is so strong and the imprint is so strong, even we don't want to be biased, but biased mind just arises. But even when those biased mind arise and recognize that, be aware of that, mindful of that. And even you have the biased mind, not try to act that biased mind. That is the one thing we try to do. You know? Even you have the biased mind, but at least not try to act that, you know. And in that way, then especially, you know, um, yeah. Especially when we have certain, you know, uh, positions, you know. Um, in general, every day, but especially when uh, we have uh, positions, you know, um, then that can create a kind of divisions, feeling hurt, so forth, you know. Um, Of course, if we don't have the bias to start with, if we don't have the biased mind, but more equanimity mind, that would be the best. That will we should aim for that. But again, to reach that, we cannot reach there immediately. It takes time, it takes practice. But you know, even when the biased mind arises, at least we recognize aware, at least we might make effort. At least we make effort not to act that bias, you know, and then treating others with that bias, you know, instead of treating them more equal, you know. Um, mm. And in terms of the the equanimity, you know, um, of course, there are many meditation and practice um, to develop, to cultivate, you know, um, many different, um, like in some of the Lojong practice, some Lamrim, you find, you know, kind of nine way of doing it in terms of you know conventional from conventional point of view from ultimate point of view different meditation different practice um, in order to develop the mind or attitude of more equanimity and uh, less bias um, but I don't know um, maybe um, I need to go in all of the details. Um, just to give little ideas, maybe I'm going to read from uh, one of the sutras um, on that subject. Where Buddha said, if one tries to befriend an enemy for a moment, he becomes your friend. So he can become a friend. You know, someone you have differences, someone you have conflict, someone uh, before, but from your side, you sincerely try to befriend them with the best intention, sincerely, truly. They can become your friend. You know, they can become your friend. It is possible. It's absolutely possible. You know, and then here Buddha said, the same thing occurs when you treat a friend as an enemy. If you treat your friends as an enemy, they will become an enemy. And, and they can become an enemy. If you treat 
If you treat your enemy as a friend, they can become a friend. If you treat your friends as an enemy, they can become an enemy. You know, um, so what it means is nothing permanent. It could change. Friend can become enemy. Enemy can become a friend. Based on how we treat them, based on how we communicate with them, based on how we interact with them, based on many other conditions. You know, based on many other conditions. Nothing is permanent. All is impermanent and all friend can become enemy, enemy can become friend. Friend and enemy can become a stranger. Stranger can become enemy as well as friend, you know, all of that. Hmm? Yet the, then Buddha said, therefore, by under the impermanence of temporal relations, relations, you know, this all relation of temporalities, you know, is impermanent temporary. Wise ones, those who have the wisdom, who can use their wisdom, the wise ones are never attached to food, clothing, or reputation, nor to friends or enemies. So, um, why you are not attached to? Because you see with your wisdom mind, you know, all of them are temporary. All of them are temporary. All of them, you know, nothing is permanent. You know, comes, goes, comes, goes. You know, change from one state to another state. You know, so with that, and then the Buddha also continue here. This one I think talking from more from many lifetimes, uh, from many lifetimes. Here he says the father becomes son in another life, mother becomes wife, enemy becomes friend. It always changes. Therefore, there's nothing definite in samsara. So, with that understanding, you know, with that understanding, we try to have less attached to some and we try to develop less, you know, anger, or hatred to some others. Instead, we try to hold them more kind of equanimity. Because everything can change. Everything can change. In that way of practice, that way of um, Reflect and contemplate is more to the reality because the reality is all the time changing. Enemy can become friend, friend can become enemy, both of them can be stranger, stranger can be both of them. You know, it's constantly, even not talking for many lifetime, even just lifetime, we see all the time. Look through the histories. You know, the war where they fought each others. Now they are the allies. You know, at one time they were the friend, ally, and now they are the enemies. You know, country to countries. You know, from group to group, society to society. You know, family to families. You know, individual to individuals. You know. It's constant, constant change. It is nothing abstract. It is something that we see around, something we experience around. Not only around, we experience in our own life. We experience in our own life. You know? We 
when we don't understand the impermanent nature of those things and when we grasp and cling as a permanent and up due to that grasping of permanent and clinging and due to that having a strong aversion and strong attachments, you know, that lead to extreme pain and suffering. That lead to extreme pain and suffering. To oneself and also we create a lot of pain and suffering to others. Um, we create a lot of pain and suffering to others due to that extreme, you know, to mind of att strong attachment and strong um, um, hatred and anger. So therefore, so meditating on that, you know, how in samsara, you know, nothing is definite as it says here, you know, always changing, always changing. It's by understanding the changing nature of that, you know. Even your best friends, family, whatever, you know, whom you feel very close, you know, that could change based, just based on small misunderstanding, small miscommunication, based on just small, you lose a moment of mind and, you know, you say something that's very hurtful, harmful, and that might be it. That might be it, you know. The relationship that you feel so close with is no more there. Small act like that, small things like that can change totally. You know, totally that can change. You know? So therefore, you know, it's much more healthy for everyone to have, you know, less attachment and aversions. When you have strong attachment, you become very controlling and possessive. And being controlling and possessive, it doesn't help you. It also doesn't help others because then you try to control it. Due to that, you know, possessive and controlling, because you try to control, then that makes others, you know, um, Uncom um, um, uncomfortable and hurt and all of that, you know. So it doesn't help you, it doesn't help others. Everyone suffer, everyone suffer. On the other hand, you know, more equanimity, you know. And of course, true love and compassion is totally different. True love and compassion is not kind of controlling, is not kind of possessive like attachments, you know, it's very different, you know. Um, so, yeah, so therefore that is, um, the same into, in, in relation to this same, topic in one of his holiness Dalai Lama's teachings compared to the bliss you know where he says the foundation for practice on seven point cause and effect method is cultivating the mind of equanimity without this foundation you will not be able to have impartial altruistic view because without equanimity you will always have partiality towards your relative and friends Realize that you should not have prejudice, or how you call prejudice, 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 prejudice. Yeah, thank you. Prejudice, hatred, or desire towards enemies, friends, and neutral person. Thus, lay a very firm foundation of equanimity. So, equanimity is 
very much emphasized, very much emphasized um, by the Buddha. Um, And of course, when we were training, you know, um, I didn't go each of them, you know, whether we were meditating on, you know, um, loving kindness, uh, true love, compassion, or sympathetic joy or joy, or equanimity, you know, we always start, there's always starting point. And then we expand that practice. And to really have better result, that is how it should be done. And that is how it is um, encouraged and advised, instructed, you know. Whether it's loving kindness, compassion, first we try to start with someone, you can develop that love and compassion, all that uh, sympathetic joy, you know, or equanimity. You try to start with somewhere most easy to feel that feeling, to to do, to have that feeling. You start with the most easy one, you know. Your most in these cases, you know, to whom you feel most close, dear, you know. Um, And then you expand it to a little bit more difficult, you know, more neutral persons, you know, more neutral persons. Uh, you might not be able to feel the love, compassion, and sympathetic joy. Same to a neutral person, the way you feel to this person at the moment. Or the close person, it, when you think of them, it you might be able to cultivate that very easily and quickly. But for the more neutral persons, like a stranger, you know, you might, it might take more time to feel that, you know, reflect, contemplate, meditate, and try to feel that same feeling. Extending that feeling you have for the friends, family, to the others. And then you extend it to the the difficult, most difficult one, the so-called enemy. And that is the big challenge. That will be the big challenge. That will be the most difficult part. But, you know, even if you want to have true love, compassion, all sentient beings, then we have to try. No matter how difficult it is, we have to try to, you know, again, you know, reflecting, contemplating, thinking of their pain, their sufferings, you know, if they are kind of, you know, engaging in the harmful actions, you know, negative actions, you know, um, why we don't agree with such behavior, such actions, at the same time, trying to understand why they do that. You know, trying to understand and trying to feel as a being why we totally disagree with their actions and their behavior. So trying to differentiate those two things, the person and the person's actions and behavior. While we don't agree, not only we don't agree, sometimes we might have to take actions to stop, you know, such harmful, you know, behavior or negative behavior or actions at the same time, you know, trying to see their suffering. Their pain. Of course, their pain and suffering is not an excuse to bring more pain to others. That is not an excuse to bring more pain to others. But at the same time, you know, you can understand, you know, like that action is absolutely not. Um, what is absolutely uh, not right, you know, should be stopped, all of that, but at the same time, understanding, you know, 
where that come coming from fear, coming from ignorance. You know, maybe there's a lot of ignorance. Maybe there's a lot of fear, you know, a um, lot of worries, you know, a lot of anger, whatever, you know, those emotions have been built over the time, you know. And so when those emotions are so strong, sometimes you cannot control yourself. Sometimes you cannot control yourself. And sometimes you don't know, you know. It blinds you. It blinds you seeing bigger pictures. It blinds you from seeing the bigger pictures. And you only see very narrow pictures. You know, you only see very narrow pictures. You can't see the bigger pictures. And then you act on the basis of that small, narrow picture you see. You know, if you see the bigger pictures, you know that it's not helpful, beneficial. It creates only more pain, more suffering with that. But sometimes that is what happens, you know, because of those when you are overpowered by strong negative emotions. And that we can realize without, you know, we try to understand others by reflecting on our, ourselves when we are in such state of mind. How do we respond? How do we do? How do we react? You know, and a lot of time, again, we, 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 we lose our mind in that moment. We lose our intelligence. You know, our, um, and we become very kind of narrow-minded. You know, we cannot see bigger pictures, long-term pictures, bigger pictures. We only see very small, narrow, you know, and so like that. So with that, you know, then, you know, and by understanding their own, their own suffering and pain, you know, uh, and understanding they are another human beings, another sentient beings who do not want suffering, but who is suffering a lot. Through that, you know, so then for such, you have to use more contemplative. You have to, because you don't feel, you don't, you cannot feel it immediately. Do you, you get it? Instead, you feel, when you think of them, maybe you might feel hostility, you know, and make, you, when you think of that person or that group or that individuals or what, or, or group of peoples or countries, whatever, you know, instead, when you think of that, instead of feeling compassion or love, you might feel kind of hostility. And so then you need to do more contemplative meditation, thinking from all those different perspectives to be able to feel it, you know. But again, be clear, clear, feeling loving kindness, compassion for someone doesn't mean allowing them to do the harmful actions. Okay? Just as the parent, when they see their children engaging something harmful, negative, even they feel compassion, they will not allow them to do that. They will not encourage them to do that. They will discourage them to do that. They will stop them from doing that. And it's not because they don't have love and compassion. Actually, it's their love and compassion that make them to do that. And so therefore, feeling love and compassion, sense of real true feeling, and then acting is a something else, you know. Um, so it doesn't mean when you feel love and compassion, it doesn't mean you give license for them to continue to do the, you know, the harmful, um, hurtful, harmful, painful um, action and create suffering. So that's, but definitely in terms of feeling, then we try to keep, which is not easy, definitely. It is not easy to feel such love and compassion, even for a stranger, forget about the enemy. You know, um, but but we do have the potential. We do have the potential to feel love and compassion even for the the enemy. Um, 
definitely it's not easy definitely um, you know it is going to take a lot of effort a lot of practice but it's not impossible it's possible and there are examples those examples are rare but there are examples you know um, as as the lama always share and i also share a story about one monk who was in prison 20 years torture him and of course not not a, not only what happened to his families his countries all that but even to, uh, also um individually also for him for um but like you know he didn't lose he kept compassion for those who are torturing him and you know he told the lama and there was two instant that he thought he might lose the compassion all these 20 years you know he was able to keep the compassion for that and so if he has done that then we all have that potentials you know not all the uh, tibetan monks who went to prison were successful like him were able to do that you know um, but there are some who are able to do that and that just showed there is a potential and so and so and once we are able to feel that for three groups you know starting with someone more easier most easier friends family and then next you know more kind of stranger neutral person and then to the enemy and then you can expand to all other sentient beings because all sentient beings kind of fall into one of those categories you know one of those categories and then when you expand to all then from that you expand to all human beings all animals and you know you know all others um beings in the six realms and then uh, embrace and to the all sentient beings and so when we really started to practice it is important to start that that way then once you are able to build up with that then it becomes stable and true otherwise you know I think we all, you know, like when I think of may all sentient beings happen and cause of happiness, if I don't think, think specifically, I can feel it. But if I have to think specifically, maybe I might struggle to feel for some people. You know, and so then all sentient beings become just an abstract. Do you get it? Very general abstract. Um, so in order not to become that, then we train with very specifically individuals and then expand to more and more that. And if we can develop, whether it's a true love, compassion, um, you know, whether it's the sympathetic joy from the, like that, then then it becomes very, very stable practice. Once we develop on the basis of that, it becomes very stable and strong. And same with the equanimity. With the equanimity, we start with someone more neutral person. It's easy to have the uh, equanimity towards more neutral persons. You know, then someone who is very close, someone whom you have a problem. And then again, uh, once you have started with a neutral, and then you know, uh, someone who is close and someone who is a distant to you, and then again expand it to all sentient beings. Okay, I think maybe I will, so I can take one, one, two questions, if there is any questions. Or... Please unmute yourself if you have any questions. Yeah, if not, then we can also do the dedications. I have a question. Yes. Um, um, what is the difference between altruism and compassion? Because in the West, altruism is defined as the belief in or practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. But some psychologists have tried to dispute that and say that it's really not possible that you always have some kind of self-interest operating behind. So, mm -hmm. I was, okay. So, so 
what do you think is the difference between the two, if if any? No, I don't know because again, altruistics is kind of the word English word, you know. Um, so again, yeah. I don't know what definition of exactly that word because you know. Um, but definitely, in, from Buddhist point of view, true love, compassion, bodhicitta, they are all part of altruistic, you know. Uh, so it's a much more broader. Um, uh, true love is altruistic. Compassion, the way we use at least the English word altruistic, you know. Uh, and from Buddhist point of view, absolutely, you know, you can reach a state where without there is without any self interest. But it's not easy, as we said, you know, to develop true compassion and true love. Because at the moment, a lot of time we talk about love, compassion, most of those love and compassion are more kind of what we describe, you know, more kind of, you know, sentimental, uh, emotional, more... Um, kind of um, sometimes um, they send some attachment involved with that, you know, um, so therefore there is some self-interest involved with that. But true, true compassion, true love, true bodhicitta is it, a state without, you know, um, selfish attitude involved. And so it is possible from Buddhist point of view. And that's because you've trained the mind really to go from uh, the personal to the stranger to the world, right? You, you, you've you got the ability to expand like that, that ultimately you're able to achieve that kind of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. Without self-interest because mm -hmm. of that training. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the reasons... The basis, that's the way we talk about, as I was reading from his own and the Lamas, about the compassions and when we, we differentiate um, about the emotional. It's not about, you know, whether he or she has any relation with me or whether he or she is nice to me, whether she or she is something I like, or nothing to do with that. It's based on your you try to develop love, compassion, based on that, they want to be happy and they don't want suffering. That is based on that. They want to be happy and they do not want suffering and they have a right to be happy and not to suffer, just like myself. On the basis of that, then that is where your true love and compassion built on the basis of that. And starting with someone who is with someone with, who is easier at the very beginning and then expand to a little more difficult and most difficult, and then to all sentient beings. So therefore, the way you train is not same like a, a normal, sentimental, emotional, that one, you know, that is that is, um, that is very different. It's the equanimity, really. That's the essential practice, the foundation out of which that these other things can expand, right? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can do dedications. Then. Due to the disvirtues, may I quickly attend the state of Buddha Buddha and lead all transmigrated beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the precious Supreme Bodhicitta not at born, arise and grow. May that arise and not decline, but increase more and more. Thank you. Uh, patience in bearing the hardship of the spreading the teaching of Muni in general and the teaching of victories 
Chungwen in the hundreds of direction, Lord of Dharma, holding three vows and wearing second room, please quickly return as the glory of Gilda's teachings. Thank you very much.